That's Hi, this is the caddyinfo.com Thursday night chat or Cadillac conversation or forum hangout is what I would call it tonight, the caddyinfo.com forum hangout. I have with me tonight Cadillac Jim from the forum. Howdy. And Texas Jim also from caddyinfo.com. Good evening, everyone. We may have KHE join us in progress. That he was able to join us last week, had his camera set up and so on. So hopefully he'll he'll think about it and join us again this week. If you want to participate live in our conversation, there's several different ways you could do it. If you'll circle me on Google Plus and let me know that you want to, then I can send you an invitation if you're all set up. If you're not set up with the camera and and uh, microphone and so on, what you can do is if you go to the event page or if you go to the YouTube page, you can post questions there that show up on our screen here. And actually, also, we like to keep an eye on the, every week there's a page on Caddy Info just about the chat, and I keep a, I keep a loose eye off on that. And then what you can do is if you post a question there, we will also try and respond. The nice thing about working through the event page and the, the YouTube page is that it actually posts questions up on our screens in the Hangout so that we see your question. And we can indicate on there which question we're addressing. And, uh, and I think it stamps the video that way. So uh, if you have a question, uh, all you need to do is to uh, get on Google Plus, find us, and click on the uh, Say Something window, and uh, you're, you're with us. Exactly so. And, and, it, and uh, if you go to the caddyinfo.com forum, there's a post for today's show. And in there, there's a link to the YouTube page, and there's a link to the Google Plus page, and there's a link to the video. If you just want to enjoy watching the video and don't want to participate, you can watch the video there. Or on the caddyinfo.com YouTube page, you can also watch the video there. So the ELR versus the Tesla S. This is the story where there is no story, but it continues on. <laughs> the, the, the ELR is a completely different car from the Tesla S, except that Cadillac chose to price it alongside the Tesla S. And, and, and you know, the best argument for doing that may be, why not? If Tesla is getting away with selling electric cars for too much money, why shouldn't Cadillac cash in on that? Well, an Escalade's a price about the same as the Corvette, and uh, that doesn't mean they're really competing with each other. Uh, they're for entirely different purposes. But I think that Cadillac is kind of photobombing the Tesla S in a way, right? That they're stealing its thunder just by continuing, you know, they tested with the Tesla S with the ELR. I think they're encouraging this comparison with the Tesla S. Well, performance-wise, if it's similar, they have a right to do that. I, uh, it, it's, it's not. not. <laughs> well, they're, com they're completely apples and werewolves. Well, no. Yeah, they're not even close. They're not even the same class of car. I would be surprised. No, the Tesla S is, is basically a mid-sized, roomy car mm -hmm. with a longer range, but it's electric only, a battery battery electric vehicle. And, of course, the ELR is a range back. extended. It's a small coupe. Okay. So completely different cars. Not, not the same size, not the same class. The only thing that's similar is they both cost a hell of a lot of money. Well, uh, hey, brother, you said it. Jim, I'm going to mute you on the forums here so that, so that, uh, and then you can jump back in when you're ready. Well, I so, don't know what to say. I, I have a hard time trying to figure out why they're trying to comparison, what they're trying to achieve, or what they would be saying in the comparison. Uh, I haven't seen the ads comparing the two. I've seen some talk on the forum, but nothing that really uh, uh, engages me. I don't really see uh, the point. Jim, you're unmuted now, or I thought you're unmuted, but you may have muted your end. He's muted himself now. Yep, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but if Tesla's getting a lot of press and ELR's not getting a lot of press, isn't this a good way to generate more buzz? It's well, just, it, it worked for Cindy Sheehan. It worked for Cindy Sheehan. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, like uh, P.T. Barnum said, I don't care what they're saying as long as they're talking about me. There you go. Any but, press is good press, right? If you're in the news, that's success. Right now, Cadillac apparently has a two-year supply of ELRs on the lots, and they're making more of them. How many? 
something like a two-year supply. At the current sales rate, they have 752 days of uh, ELRs available, and they made uh, 100 well, more, 120 that's... more, or something last month. Okay, I, I'm more comfortable with numbers because when you divide numbers together like that, you get linear projections into the far future, which generally don't uh, make much sense. So, so I think that means that they've made a couple of thousand of them, and they're yeah. only selling at you know 800 a year. Now, yeah. if the ELR is not going to be successful, would you finish a build out of say 2,500 and then just stop production? Well, wait a minute. If it's not going to be successful, I'm not sure that's a meaningful question. I'm not sure that's why they would do that, or if it's part of the thinking. But uh, uh, if I want to answer your question and try to be a good guy here, uh, uh, if it's not, if I decided that I was going to end production, would I just build a bunch to meet demand into, uh, for the foreseeable future and then quit? Yeah, that, that's a that's an exit strategy. So, but I don't think we're looking at an exit strategy. And it may be that I'm kind of thinking old-fashioned manufacturing because the lines now are flexible lines where you can bring so many of this one or, you know, they do one car after another. In mm -hmm. other words, they could, on, at, uh, the ELR is made at Hamtramck, but they could make a vault, a vault, a vault, an ELR, a vault, a vault, a vault at Hamtramck, and they don't care, right? It's the machines know which car's next. They queue up the bins, and they're happy. And so it's not like the old days where you kind of tool up, you know, make one car, take the line down, be down a week, retool, make the next car, and so on. Well, I think that uh, uh, stocking up like that you know, implies to me that they uh, plan on a big sales event in the near future. That's what it sounds like to me. I, I don't think that it's uh, uh, production mechanics. It could be uh, uh, for a volume that small. That's not a lot of cars in the automobile business, a couple of thousand. But... Um, yes. Uh, it, uh, if they if they are just build a couple of thousand, that might mean okay they're going to have a big sales event in uh, in June. That's a good well, month to, to buy an ELR, don't you think? Kids out of school. Be, they may be committed to buying, you know, two three thousand parts worth of ELRs from their suppliers regardless. And so you might as well build them out, right? I I that's. Uh, uh, I, uh, to me, the ILS is slaved to the production and the deployed systems, not uh, not something that drives the production. <laughs> but and that's just me. But yeah, I'm just I I've seen when car companies are going out of business, that's what they ended up deciding to do. Like Saab did that, where they did one last run of the Saabs, mm -hmm. because. Uh, Jim, you're unmuted on our end. I think you're muted on your end. Uh, am I back? Oh, now you're, you're back. back. <laughs> so the, uh, they did one more run of sobs because the the assembled cars were worth more than the parts. Well, that's a switch. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we're worth more to them than the parts. You know, they could they could sell assembled cars off to dealers. Mm -hmm. As as makeup cars, but parts I think you'd have to have you'd have to stay there for a while and sell them, right? Parts yeah. parts probably have a more a higher absolute value, but they have more investment, yeah. a time investment. Well, at any rate, I really think that uh, the only the only thing that really makes sense to me uh, from what uh, who they are, what they have, and what they're doing is they're planning a sales event. And also, though, the the twenty fifteens probably aren't that much different, and they can. Uh, uh, turn them into 2015s with an upgrade. Uh, now I don't know why that I was surprised the ELR didn't come with a much larger battery pack and give it you know a 75 mile range. That would have I been my too. strategy with the ELR is make it make it a better volt right instead of a Cadillac volt. I think it was uh, uh, yeah that surprises me too. But my guess is that they did it because of uh, 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 performance and cost. It drive the cost up and drive the uh, performance down. Yeah, but if they were going to charge $75,000 for it anyway. Now, the counter argument is 75000 is really what the vaults should cost, too. Yeah. And that GM's, you know, eating money on every one of them. Well, uh, I'm still, uh, you know, uh, uh, d d we've decided to, uh, uh, you know, clean up the, my wife's Pontiac and, uh, 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 you know, uh, keep it. But uh, if we do decide to get another car for her, the vault is on the table. I mean, it's a, 
uh, a lot cheaper than the, the uh, ELR uh, uh, does the same thing. She she drives maybe two thousand miles a year, and most of it's just very short trips. So uh, we can yeah, plug it in the Yeah, she needs a Duke SS one hundred is what she needs. That's now the perfect she, car for two thousand miles a year. Uh, well, that'd be <laughs> perfect. Yeah, except that she uh, uh, she drives in the rain. No, no, you can't drive it in the rain. Yeah, you, she does you probably could, sunroof. but it's not recommended. She closes the sunroof. I will give her that. Oh, if if she's driving in the rain. Yes. But if now, she's you drive sun, a little bit faster, you can drive in the rain and not close the sunroof. That is actually what the what the roadster guys say too. That if you're actually going fast enough, the raindrops, the wind carries the rain up over the the uh, cabin. Yeah. I, I I don't believe that, or I would be stuck at a light with it pouring down rain in the cabin. But <laughs> I took the I took the roadster out tonight to the hamburger place to pick up hamburgers after I put the uh, uh, center cap back on, and the uh, as soon as I arrived there, one drop of rain fell on my nose, and so I just held my breath the whole time. But the rain held off and and uh, got back in the roadster and, and got back home safe and dry. So. Mm. Now, Cad Award Automotive said today that Cadillac had decided not to make a large version of the SRX, a seven-passenger yeah, uh, crossover, as, which would be a large people carrier version of the SRX. Now, do you think that Cadillac's missing that? No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> At least we well, agree. So talk about that. Let's hear those two opinions. Texas Jim, why do you think they're not missing that? I don't see any point in it, personally. Because that doesn't appeal uh, to you, but but that is a segment that people are buying, and and uh, Mercedes has a big minivan kind of thing, right? The Mercedes R class is like a, a mid-sized minivan. Yeah, I've seen several of them, and there's usually one or two people in them. Exactly. But if that would even even ninety percent of the SRXs I see, there's one person driving it, and that's it. Occasionally on weekends you'll see a man and a woman and a couple of kids, but typically there's just one or two people in them. But so isn't the Escalade basically? That, if you did need a seven-passenger car, would, couldn't you get an Escalade for that purpose? Then exactly. Yeah. They've already got a. They've already got a bigger vehicle. They don't need another one. Now, the that joy of this would be the Escalade gets 19 miles per gallon in the city on a good day, and this would get, I'm, I'm sorry, on the highway, and then this would instead get uh, 25 miles per gallon on the highway, right? But Something if you make it nature. bigger and heavier and longer and bulkier, it's not going to get 25. Well, it's bigger, and but it's not heavier. The Escalade, of course, weighs, you know, a ton, you know, I'm going to get it wrong, but I'm going to say 7,000 pounds. About that, yeah. And so this would actually be like a 4,500-pound minivan, something in that nature, like the midsize uh, uh, things that GM's making for other brands. So it actually wouldn't be as heavy as an Escalade. It'd have a smaller engine, wouldn't have as good a performance as an Escalade, but it would get much better miles per gallon. Now, I mean, would you rather, if that's not coming... That's a good weight for a daily driver. When do you think we're going to see the smaller SRX? They keep promising us a BRX, which would be, you know, something one size smaller than an SRX. The SRX is a pretty hefty car, would, close. Uh, personally, I think that would be a smarter move than making a bigger one. Yeah, except, they like to... except if they do that, then that's going to cut in significantly on the sales of the one they have now. Because a lot of people will go to the smaller one. Well, they'll go to the least expensive one. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that, that the SRX has going for it really well, remember when it was competing side by side with the station wagons, but the SRX was $5,000 less? And I always thought that was, that was uh, why the SRX sales are where they're at, is because it's significantly cheaper than the stands are, or the station wagon was. Yes. Now the, that's, that's they weighted it down with bad engines. So, so Cadillac Jim, you said, yeah, we're missing the seven-passenger people mover. Why do you think we are missing it? 
Well, there's a big segment out there with the livery trade and the fleet guys and the uh, commercial chassis. Uh, you know, if you're going to get into a, um, a chauffeur-driven uh, uh, limousine service car, uh, or you, do you want something with a fast back or do you want something with a full-size headroom in the back seat? Uh, this kind of thing. That's the market I was thinking of. But uh, as soon as I said it, I realized that, oh, they're probably just uh, uh, going to configure Escalades for that market. And because they already have one, Jim said pretty much the same thing. Yeah, and, the, and, the, and again, the problem with the Escalade is it doesn't get the miles per gallon that people are looking for in that market now, that they want to have their cake and eat it too and carry seven people and get, you know, 20 miles per gallon in the city and, and uh, 25 on the highway. Well, when you are in that business, you uh, your cost of operation is uh, based on a lot of things besides gas mileage. And I think the Escalade is going to look very good at 250,000 miles a year. So if they built a a SRX like car on the and made it rear wheel drive and built it on the ATS, would that be the way to go? So I think what they're missing is a sporty utility vehicle. Uh, well, couldn't they do that with an SRX V? Yeah, but they've held away from that because it's they they don't like to go with the V with any of their front wheel drive platforms. Oh yeah. So, that's so they won't cool. go V with the XTS. They won't go V with the with the SRX. But if they come out with this BRX and it's rear wheel drive, now do you think it has to be front wheel drive? Are you expecting it to be front wheel drive? Front wheel all wheel drive? I I really cannot see that now that you mention it a a V in a front wheel drive vehicle an all wheel drive. Yeah, but not a transverse engine. Uh, they're too front heavy. Now, I think the XTS V Sport argues well that the XTS could be a V if they let it. What I'd do is an all wheel drive XTS and stick the biggest darn engine I can put in there that the all wheel drive will take. And that may be what they've done with the V Sport, right? Because they held it back to 350 foot pounds of torque instead of 410. Well, uh, they, they really want to have it uh, set a record for its class at Nurmagring Ring without killing anybody. And uh, so um, uh, they have to have the chassis, dynamics, and the safety. And uh, if it's going to be a Cadillac, it's got to have the durability. So Yeah, uh, you can't blow the, the uh, all-wheel drive off the car coming off the dealer a lot, right? Uh, well, that would be bad publicity, yeah. But uh, what I'm thinking is if you got 400 pound-feet of torque and uh, 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 some uh, mouth breather uh, nails it and the stabella track doesn't catch it before it flips, it turns sideways and flips, uh, you know, that's not good for publicity either. There was, there was a lot of that with the supercars before electronic stability control. I remember a video of a, uh, a Corvette following an STSV wagon or shooting brake, as they call them in England, uh, chasing uh, uh, a Porsche and or a Ferrari or something and catching it, but when he went to pass it, he got a line on passing it and instead of easing the throttle down, he nailed it, went sideways, lost his speed and just waved the Corvette around uh, to go after him. He had been riding the guy, waiting for that opportunity. He could have passed him easily on that long straight, but he blew it for a lap and wasn't going to waste everybody's time and he was a gentleman about it. But he just plain did not know what he was doing. He, did, he saw a, a shot we wanted to go straight ahead, and he floored it. And, of course, uh, uh, the laws of uh, acceleration, traction, limits, and so forth said that the, the numbers weren't there, and the stability track kept him from going completely out of control. But uh, uh, what can I say? Um, uh, you know, when I, when I got that 66 Corvette, I heard stories for the first several weeks about people who would be upside down the road without knowing what happened with those things. Usually they'd had them for just a few days. Now, how yeah. well how well do you remember the '66 Corvette drove? Someone oh, was in my I'm office the other day, and he claimed that those cars drove like a truck. Well, his might have. Compared to the new ones, they do. Well, the, uh, 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 some of them might have. Mine did not. Uh, mine uh, had um, steel belted radials and the off-road suspension, and had uh, it did not have power steering or power brakes. But it had the uh, uh, there was a, a different ring. You put the steering uh, 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 the pitman arm. You, uh, you put the uh, steering uh, link in for power steering for faster steering. Mine was in that that hole. It was in the power steering hole. But I did not have power steering. And uh, uh, 
the combination was that uh, there was nothing wrong with the way that thing drove or handled. And uh, uh, yeah, I, they came with bias ply tires, and I, I spent a couple of days trying to mess with that thing. And uh, uh, on on uh, after two or three days, within uh, uh, I was uh, you know just checking the lower RPM range, the normal driving range, and I put it in fourth gear at idle, which is about 25 miles an hour, and eased down on the throttle. And at about 35, the steering wheel got a little light and it got a little little wishy-washy. And I looked in the rearview mirror and I saw tire smoke. And I thought, uh, they charged me extra for these tires. They, they were the, 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 had the gold stripe on them instead of the white walls. Uh, but they were nice, top quality, two-ply, bias-ply tires. Well, I drove it home and parked it because I finally realized that it just wasn't safe to drive. And I got on the phone and I ordered some Michelins out of Houston. When they came in, uh, uh, I drove over and put the Michelins on it. <coughs> and uh, while while they were putting the Michelins on, we were talking about the, uh, how everybody got at least 40,000 miles out of it, and a lot of people got a lot more than that. And they were saying, well, the reason they wear so good is because they don't slip. These Michelin's hold, they stick like glue, they do not slip, and if they don't slip, they're not going to wear. And I thought that made a lot of sense, but I accidentally broke traction uh, leaving the driveway, so I kind of think that <laughs> didn't hold for me. But uh, the cars, uh, everybody had uh, Pirellis and Dunlops that had the, the hot tires. Those were regulars, but they weren't steel belted. And uh, I went with Michelin's because I, I heard they gave you a better feel and better grip. And everybody was the word was that Michelin's were small car tire, small car tires that they held like uh, uh, glue, but if they broke, they broke hard. And if you drove them on a big car, you'd end up in a ditch because you'd be in there cornering, and all of a sudden when it let go, you'd just have no hope. And uh, this is uh, they might have done that on little cars, but they didn't do that on my car. <laughs> uh, uh, so at 23,500 miles, when I sold the car, still had those tires on it. They still had good tread. The uh, uh, the uh, Dunlops got uh, uh, they got different mileage depending on the front of the rear and the brand and so the four numbers I'm trying to remember but they varied from eight to twelve thousand miles on the front the Dunlops got twelve thousand and the uh, the Pirellis on the rear got uh, eight thousand miles or something like that wearing them slick on on these big block Corvettes and these are not people that went around squirreling them either everybody drove them carefully because you had to you know. <laughs> To, you know, to uh, fit in with traffic. Now, one of the questions you ask on the forum this week, or, or you had responded to somebody in a, in a question about lead additive and, a, and the 69. Yeah. Someone else, oh. you had said you could drive it all day well, no, on I did, regular I did. gas. No, I didn't say that. What uh, He said that uh, 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 cars sold just before the uh, uh, they switched to unleaded gas uh, would have to have lead additives if you're going to do them as a daily driver. And I said some did and some didn't. Now, I, but but and I didn't know about this particular. So th thank you for I that correction. Mine, mine did not have a problem. But the, the, the point was when I went off to research this topic, I was intrigued again when the guy said the 472 and the 500. In other words, the engines, the engines from the early 70s and and even the the preceding engines in the late 60s were so over engineered that they were just beautifully done well I think that's uh, 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 overstating it uh, the, the the problem was that a lot of uh, engines for longevity in the valves uh, uh, depended whether they were designed that way or not or intended that way or not on a coating of lead on the backs of the valves that uh, kept the exhaust gases from heating the valves up the way they would do with unleaded gas and that 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 coating not there and if you took these these particular engines and ran them on unleaded gas you would have valve life problems sometimes a bad one sometimes uh, um, uh, sometimes not but in point of fact this was a problem with a lot of cars with a lot of cars it was not a problem but the cars that it was not a problem doesn't mean that they were built like tanks it just means that they uh, 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 their valves didn't run as hot. Now there are a lot of reasons valves don't run as hot. For example, the the valve stems might have been thick enough to carry the heat away, and the valve seats might have been closer to the heads when the valves were open. Uh, 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 I, I don't know. I have no idea. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the but, valve but seats might have carried the heat away better. So know, not not necessarily just on the valve question though, but in terms of engine life, 
How reliable do you think the 472s and the 500s were? Very Rick's. reliable. Rick's they just totally ran and ran and ran and ran. Mm -hmm. On anything. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was that comment that was intriguing <clears throat> to me, is, is that idea that, you know, one of the nice things about the engine and the Roadster is, is uh, people write that it was over-engineered for the amount of power it put out, which I appreciate. And so that, and that part appealed to me about the 472 and the 500. Now, the problem these days is you don't have people who are familiar with those engines to work on them, right? Yeah, yeah but... but. Never but did. You don't really you don't really <laughs> need you don't really need anyone to work on those. Yeah. Because they're simple. They're distributor, they're plug wires, there's carburetors. And now they did you know, have fuel injection in some models. Yeah. You you don't have uh you but don't you have all of the complicated of models. You don't have all the complicated stuff you have on them now. And they're they're just relatively easy to work on. I've, I've worked I've worked on the the four seventy two and five hundred a little bit. My brother, that used to be all he'd buy for several years. He kept the you know the big sedan Devils. He had three big old boys, and he's he's six foot eight. You know weighs about three hundred pounds, and uh, his his oldest son now is bigger than he is. Wow. He, he's, he's not quite as tall, but he weighs a little more. So you got to be careful if you invite them out to dinner, huh? But uh, when 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 his boys were growing up, you know, they were always, you know, big old boys. And he he drove them big Cadillacs till they got grown. Now he drives Impalas. Well, his wife drives Impalas. He drives a... a Chevy pickup, but but he had several of them, and over the years, you know, I've helped him tinker with them a little bit, and they were just really easy to work on. Even the battery was where you could get to it; it was where it was supposed <laughs> to be. Well, I knew you know, people. Right up, right I, there I, behind I, the. I knew right people there behind the. It was it was right there behind the passenger side headlights. Mm -hmm. Now the only problem was getting it out. You had to you had to bring it up about an inch or so. Then you had to tilt it towards the windshield and then bring it on out because they was a the the piece that runs across the top of the radiator. Yeah. Was right across that. Mm -hmm. But He's he's big enough and strong enough and had large hands. I saw he was messing with it one day. He's going to change the battery. He had already went and bought a new battery, and he was trying to get it out and it wouldn't come out. So he just he get he gets mad real easy. Well, he don't anymore, but he used to when he was younger. And he just reached in there with his hand like this and just put his hand around the battery and just picked it up with one hand and picked the battery up. So that was the easy way to get it out. So that's course, how I found people, out they would tip back and they'd come out through the hole, huh? Most people can't do that. But. Yeah, <laughs> right. I knew uh, people that had two of those in boats. They drove around on, on Lake Austin. And uh, if you can build a marine version of an engine uh, uh, without modifying the block, it means there's enough built-in cooling in the block for it to output sustained horsepower at its rated power for an extended period of time. There were very few automotive engines that were built that way. Now, a lot, now, a lot of some people used to take the 455 Oldsmobile and build it marine engine. Yeah, because they yeah, would the, sit there and run at 4,500 RPM all day long. Yeah, and now, of course I'm holding my breath for next year's V series cars, but I actually think the CTS V Sport right now is striking that almost ideal balance, right? Where it's making good power, it's in the and it's below 4.5 seconds zero to 60, and it gets 25 miles per gallon on the highway. That sounds good to me. You know that seems like it's hitting just the right points, but yeah. if, and, if and I was it, go ahead, go ahead, Bruce. I'm sorry. I, want I, was fixing, one. I was fixing to say if I was in the market and had the money, I would seriously, I would seriously look at the V Sport, you know, it's, compared to the V, and compare the difference in price 
and see if the little bit of extra performance out of the V would be worth it over the V Sport. And, and brand new, they're very close in price. Unfortunately, that by the time you get a V Sport Premium, you could have got a CTSV. But the the odd thing is the V Sport is putting up numbers very close to the CTSV numbers, and it should not be because it does you know it has much less horsepower and they weigh close enough to the same that. The V Sport weighs 3,900 pounds and has 420 horsepower, but it's but it's. I think there's a couple of things. I do think they're getting some magic out of that eight-speed transmission, and uh, and it may have you know a better launch for some reason. Maybe I tuned think the to a tires, better launch. Tires have changed the last several years, and the suspension's improved. Things like that. Now you're more sensitive to that than I am, so I'm I'm listening, but I. I'm surprised that tires would have changed that much. In the last four years, uh, I think so. Uh, I've been wa I watched tires change while I had that Eldorado in the past two or three years. There was a demonstrable improvement every pair of tires I got, and the tires I've got now I think are heads and shoulders above the tires that came on the car. And uh, there's not the only, they're not the only brand of tires that's, that's good out there. I mean, uh, uh, I've got uh, you know good years. But I'm sure the Michelins are just as good. And they're four season tires. They're not even summer tires. The over the years that I've bought tires, you know, it's just been a continual improvement. Ever seems like every set I buy is better than yeah. you know, the set I had before. Yeah, but the high performance tires seem to me the last few sets I've bought have been have improved more rapidly than and you, you, you expect something that you can tell after you've driven a while. You can tell within a block with uh, nowadays with, the, with you know, and then, then the two-year cycle of changing tires. That there's there's an improvement like that. The so car, the tires, the tires that came on my car, mm -hmm. they were real sticky. They held the road good, mm -hmm. but they rode like an ox cart because the sidewall was just really, really stiff. Mm -hmm. And they were noisy. Yeah. Once Thanks. you got, once you had, oh, over six, seven, eight thousand miles on them, they got mm -hmm. really, really noisy. They'd be non-starters today. They yeah. lasted good. Yeah. And I hated to get rid of the uh, tires with three-quarter tread on them. Mm -hmm. You know, just because of the noise. So I tolerated the noise. I also had the road hazard replacement on it, and it happened to work out that about the time they'd get down to half tread, one or two of them would go bad for some odd reason, either, you know, get a nail on the sidewall mm -hmm. or, you know, get where they couldn't balance it, you know, have a, have a broke belt or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. So they kept replacing them. Yeah, <laughs> you know the same tires they just so they kept replacing. Yeah, and uh, it was heck. It was like I don't know eighty thousand miles when I finally, yeah, you know, just got sick of it and said, "Forget it. I'm done with it. I want a, I want a different kind of tire." Well, you know that's something I learned when I was living in Texas is you don't back over the possums because their teeth will poke holes in the tires. Yeah. yeah. And but, uh, if but you do that, tires, the tire dealers will sink their teeth into you for a given make, and they'll never let you go. When when I was uh, when I was a kid, and all through my teenage years, well, heck, up up until just before Dad died, he was in the tire business, and uh, so you know I learned a little bit about tires down <laughs> down through the years, yeah. and uh, the from then till now, of course, that's a long time. But tires have just steadily improved in all all forms. Yeah. You know whether it's the off-road tires or high-performance tires or mm. you know four-season street tires. Yeah. They're just so much better now than they were ten years ago, and those were better, significantly better than they were ten years before that. And they they just keep making them better and better. They make them more. They handle better now. They hold the road better. But 
I do think tires are noisier now than they used to be in general. Mm -hmm. Not all tires, but the majority of them. You, you can, uh, sometime when, if, if it ever handy, when you're at a, at a service station that's close to the freeway, just listen at the noise, you know, the tar noise of yeah. cars going down the road. And it, it's just, it's just pretty dang loud. And if, if, as, as the different cars go by, most of them will be about the same. Every once in a while, one will come by that's running real quiet tires. And I always want to jump in my car and chase him down and say, yeah. what kind of tires are those? Yeah, generally they're referred to touring tires as car as tires that are more quiet oriented on the ride, right? And, yeah. and so, the, so there is actually a subclass that you can shop for touring tires that are supposed to be quieter. Yeah, but in general, even the touring tires are noisier than they were several years ago. Now you the first thing you, I always you didn't used to hear anyone complain, or very seldom you'd hear anyone complain about tire noise. But in the, the last ten or twelve years, tire noise has gotten real bad. And you know, the first thing I do with my cars is open up the exhaust and open up the intake, and so tire noise is not. I don't hear a lot of tire noise with my car, but I wouldn't. Well, that's why we have Bose sound systems. Just crank it up. Now, close the windows, turn up the radio. Turn up the radio. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, XM's got my radio back on again this week trying to get me to send them money. So. I think I'm going to fold on that game sooner or later. I like that XM radio. You can get it for less than $100 a year. Yeah. Yeah, but you got to be willing to, and they'll do the. They gotta keep sending me a thing for turn it on for six months for twenty five dollars, but then you got to call them after six months and tell them to turn it off, and then make them give you another good deal again, right? Yeah. And so I every six months, mine, I get them. mine. A, I get mine a year at a time for ninety eight dollars. Yeah, that's the what's it? The, uh, music. Uh, that's uh, everything. That's that's everything. the whole the whole shooting match. Hmm. But do you have to fuss at them to get it? Yeah, you have to threaten to cancel. Yeah. yeah. You gotta and, then, and then they transfer <laughs> you to a supervisor. To they transfer you to a supervisor and they right. say, well, you know, they can't do it. Okay, then turn it off. Well, let me check. Let me see if I can find. Oh, yeah, I've got this deal. You know, it just, yeah. it just started, you know. Just happens. That, I, if, you, that, that if you say you no know three times, then you can have the good deal. And say, I don't want that. But and see, so they, they will. They always want your credit card number. Yes. Oh, don't give them a good one. Because they want to be on the record board. of the month club, right, where they can just keep charging you forever. Well, what happens is when your subscription runs out, they automatically char charge you the full you know, right. monthly price, you know, 25 right. bucks a month or whatever it is. 16 or whatever. So what I do is I go to the bank, I get one of them temporary numbers, and I put just enough money on it. It's a one-time use. Once you use it one time, it's dead. Hmm. Right. So I put enough money on it to pay them with, and then I call them and, well, I don't mind giving you my credit card number, you know. Oh, okay. But you and give them a, a throwaway, yeah. Yeah, but I, I just give them a throwaway number. Now, I had hooked up, because I've got an audio connection in the SDSV, and so I'd hooked up Pandora radio and was running that on my iPhone and then connecting it through the sound system. So that works fine, except they don't have a lot of talk radio stations. And when I'm traveling cross-country, I actually like talk radio, among other things, you know. I do, too. XM has a lot of talk radio. Yeah. Yeah, I, like, I actually like the, uh, the Trucker Channel on XM. For, Road Dog? For, yeah, yes. And what is it? Road Dog. Road Dog. Road Dog, yeah. Because they'll talk about the business of trucking, which I really enjoy. I, I don't plan to be in the business of trucking, and I don't plan to be a truck driver, but I like economic discussion. Yeah. You know, when you're going along, that makes an interesting topic about, you know, how do you manage your your fuel premiums with the, the, the truck costs and the number of miles you're going and da-da-da, so... Hmm. I was talking to my brother earlier today, and his truck rolled over half a million miles today. Wow. 
Just getting broke in, right? Yeah, it's 2006. Yeah. But the big trucks go tons of miles, don't they? Yeah. Well, and he, he got engines he got are higher used. reliability. Yeah, he never got it used. It'd have been a company truck. You never start them cold. What? Never start diesel trucks cold. Well, if you drive a half million miles every six years, you, they never do get cold. Uh, yeah, keep them running, and and yeah. you're in good shape, right? That's right. My other, my other brother traded trucks last year. He had a, uh, <clears throat> it was a Kenworth, and I've got some pictures. He sent me some pictures he took when it rolled over a million miles. Hmm. Uh, then, uh, I don't know, it had about a million, 150,000 on it. He traded it, got him a newer truck. Why, was he tired of driving it? Well. Needed well, tires. it was it was starting to <laughs> it was starting to give trouble, you know. Oh yeah. First one thing and another. Yeah. He'd go out and run two or three weeks, come back in, spend a week working on it, and go out yeah. and run two or three, four weeks, come back in, spend a week working on it, and yeah. spending most of what he was making, you know, yeah. working on it. So he traded it and got a newer truck with a lot less miles. Now, the old joke is he traded because the ashtray was full, right? Mm-hmm. I knew a, a lady who got persuaded by a Hyundai dealer to trade her car in because the battery was dead. No. <clears throat> I'm, that's, I'm, not, I'm not making this up. You can't yeah. make that stuff up. I think it's My unfortunate bad. when people get... Uh, when people don't know, you know, one of the things I tried to teach my son, and and he's still pretty good about, is just say no to what you know. Go go to get what you went to get, and say no to everything else. Yep. And her, then, uh, her problem is she went to the dealer for a battery. Yeah, but not for a new car. Well, no, but they sold her a new car because they kept talking to her about how expensive the battery was, and the way I found out was. Uh, um, I was, uh, she was over visiting my wife and I was, uh, changing the battery on my motorcycle. And she said, well, I thought a motorcycle was like a car. And I says, yeah, it is. And the battery's like a car battery. And I said, yeah, it is. Since I changed <clears throat> mine every two years. Well, actually I don't anymore because I keep a battery tender on it. But, um, that's, that's, then she got this stricken look on her face and, and, uh, that's, for, that's how I knew oh, dear. That, the fact that she had just gotten a new car. Well, if you don't know anything about cars and you're not certain mm -hmm. about cars, find a car friend and get them to go with you to the dealership. Right. Yeah. You know, if you're here and you need help and you know me, then come talk to me about your car shopping. doesn't have to be for a Cadillac, but I, I would be happy to assist you. And, and your car, if you find your friends, one of your friends that's a car person, that they'd be happy to assist you too, that I enjoy shopping for cars. Uh, as much as I do talking about cars. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, if you need help, ask one of your car friends, and they will help you with the whole transaction. Well, if you got two women, your friend, your woman and your friend's a woman, bring along a hidden camera, and you might have a viral hit on YouTube. There you go. Yeah. little hint there. My dad, when I was, when I was growing up, he traded cars every year. Well, uh, you can do that if you got a friendly dealer and uh, you know that just uh, doesn't want to make a mint on you every transaction. Well, cars wasn't near as expensive way back then as they are now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, like, but I mean, relative to the income, do you think that they're a lot more expensive now? Yes. Oh, absolutely. No question. Because I would have said, you know, back in the day when a house was twelve thousand dollars and a car was two thousand dollars. Is about like today. Well, uh, houses are another thing that's a lot, uh, a lot more expensive for income. I mean, the uh, the years, uh, the days of, you know, I, I remember uh, reading something about Model Ts from the 30s. They said uh, reliability can be a problem, especially the second year. Now, reading between the lines, they were they they lasted typically two years, and that's about right. Uh, and uh, what do they cost? Two hundred fifty, three hundred dollars. Uh, but uh, a new Chevrolet in 1961, I happen to remember this price, is $1,200 start. And a good one was under $2,000. And uh, I'll say a, um, 
starting salary for a bachelor's degree was something like five thousand dollars a year so we're talking three months pay for a new car uh, on, in the Chevrolet class so uh, uh, today let's say uh, starting uh, salary for a new grad is sixty thousand dollars and a car is uh, twenty five thousand so uh, it's more like five six months pay whereas it used to be three months pay so it's uh, they hadn't quite doubled, you know, just looking at those numbers. And I'm sure, you know, I'm just sitting here in the middle of the and night. And now you get an eight-year um, loan. What's it, uh, well, <laughs> that's another thing is uh, the loans used to be uh, a year. Then uh, in the 50s, they started talking uh, two years and 18 months and three years in the 60s and now uh, five years, the last couple of years. Now they want you to just lease the damn things and you just take a, uh, a bath when, it, when the lease is up. On every car over and over and over again, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, um, uh, you know, that, uh, that's it. Of course, uh, a long time ago, when I bought my first car, I looked at the cost of insurance, the cost of the payments, and the interest, and I hauled out my slide rule and a piece of paper and spent all day, and I figured out that the, the difference between paying cash for the car and paying for it the way people do was three to one. You paid three times as much for a car and interest and extra insurance. The insurance companies would gig you if they, uh, if you know, if they were covering uh, a loan because they knew you had to pay it, uh, it's not that bad anymore. I don't think there's any difference anymore. But um, uh, uh, this uh, is, is I worked for years and years and years. I skipped buying cars, drove cars a, a long time, and uh, this, compromised a couple of times, and eventually got to the point where I could was paying cash for used cars. And that's uh, I believe in it. Yeah, that's the way to go. Now. Somebody was talking to me again about uh, they were they were after we had the intervention about wheels they were trying to talk to me about uh, one of my car friends was trying to talk to me about now you got to sell the Duke Register and go get you know a real uh, a manufactured car. Well, if he had it, that's what he would have to do. You're you. <laughs> but now part of his premise though was. You want to buy a car, you know, a classic car that if you put some money into it, it will appreciate. And and that got me off to thinking about cars and appreciation because I've always thought cars, you don't buy, cars are not an investment. That you buy cars because you enjoy driving them, you buy cars because you enjoy tinkering with them. And, you know, if you lose a minimum amount of money, that's success. But well. You're not buying it. You're not. You don't have that thing as a business. You're not in it as a business. So that kind of but, thing. But this fella off. does think about cars that way. Well, he then he should money. treat them that way. He treats. He should treat them that way. He should make he, those decisions. He had some money back in the day, and so he would buy, you know, a Shelby Cobra, or he would buy a, a Porsche Speedster, or he would buy uh, those cars and keep them a few years and sell them for more than he paid for them. Yeah. So have you guys now? Y'all may have done that several times in your life. We bought a car and then actually had it appreciate. Oh, I had a Honda 750 for 25 years and sold it for more than I paid for it. Yeah, I found that uh, motorcycles tend to tend to depreciate less rapidly than the American dollar uh, once they're a year old. Uh, but um, uh, uh, cars, um, no, I haven't really had that experience with a car. Jim, Texas, Jim, um, what do you think? I've had a I've had a couple, uh, like the '78 Corvette Anniversary Edition, the mm -hmm. L82. Mm -hmm. I sold, I kept it. I had it about a year, and Did you buy sold it, it more than I paid for it. Huh? Buy it new? No, no, no. I bought no. it used. See, I think that's the key because one of the an interesting thing when a couple came to look at my '92 when I was selling it. And and the guy's dad came with him and he looked at it and he said, you know, you could buy this and this is a fair price. But he said, you won't be able to turn around and sell this for a lot more money than you bought it. Like you have done with some other cars, he said. And so I wonder if the key to appreciation on used cars is, you know, you buy a car for half what it's worth and then drive it for a year and then sell it for about what it's worth. So you, yeah. you really have to be... You know, ten thousand dollars in your hand, ready to buy a twenty thousand dollar car when somebody's hard up and has to sell it. Yeah, that and a car that has that kind of possibility uh, needs rehabilitation, which is uh, foreseeable and and right. can be planned. Well, now, for, you know, you for see, several, 
for several years. I say several, about five years, uh, before my little neighborhood bank that I knew the I knew the owner of the bank, the president of the bank. We were pretty good friends, and I would go to the auction. A friend of mine had a little sideline as a car dealer, so I would use his license. I would go to the auto auction, the dealers only auction, not not them kind that's open to the public. Right. I went to the dealers only auction, and I would buy one year old luxury cars. That was all I bought. And I'd put them on a six month note. Nothing was due till the end of six months. And I could drive it six months. Sometimes I'd, if I really liked it, I'd roll the note over, drive it for a year, and then sell it for what I paid for it. I never did try to make any money. I just tried to make quick sales. You know, when the right. note started coming due, you know, run an ad in the paper and sell it. I never, never had any problem selling it. Now the because reason you I bought, bought it below market, because I bought it, you know, below market. Yeah, I bought it wholesale. And when I run an ad in the paper, you know, I'm selling it below what dealers are selling it for, but still, you know, above wholesale. So I, but you I know, guess... I usually make, I, I'd usually make, you know, a few hundred dollars, but I really wasn't trying to make much money off of it. But I would price them a little bit higher than what I would actually take. And some people would try to negotiate the price and some wouldn't. Right. And by selling the luxury cars, by, by the time I sold them, they were about two years old. Most of the people buying a two-year-old luxury car, I bought Cadillacs, I bought a couple of Lincolns, uh, bought Jaguars, you know, stuff like that. And... When I would go to resell them, the people coming to buy that type car either had the financing or had the money. Right. Now I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to try to do that with Chevrolets or Fords. They'd want to trade their old one, and you know, can you carry the note? You know. Right. But with luxury cars, you don't have to worry about that because people understand that it's their problem. You know, to have the money. Yeah, and they've learned financial they're, planning they're, by then. Yeah. They're actually easier to sell than cheap cars are. Mm -hmm. But again, the key was you got the car for below market to start. Yes. Now, a lot of the times the cars you see at auction, there's something, there's a reason they're at auction though, right? I mean, well, the you, nicer cars the dealers keep on their lot to sell. Right, that's, that's not the ones they keep. Usually the, the one-year-old cars that are at the auction have more miles than normal. Right. Or if you figure 10 or 12,000 miles a year normal on a luxury car, these might have 20 or 25,000. Mm -hmm. But I only drove them around and, and I usually kept two. And the wife drove one. She never put any miles on it. You know, she'd go to the store or something and would take trips than the one I had when we took trips. So right. by the time it was two years old, the mileage was a lot more back in line. So you caught up. Yeah. It should be. And uh, so then it wasn't considered a high mileage car. When it was one year old, it was a high mileage car. Right. By the time it was two years old, it didn't drive it much. But I was in a real estate business then, and that was basically a six or seven day a week job. I mean, a six or seven, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you worked every day if you was going to make any money. Yeah. And uh, so, but I, so that know, seems like the key now, to moving to flipping cars, though, is and that's the same thing they show on the TV programs, right? Is that they're getting the car for significantly less than than it they should, and then correct. they've got room to room to dick around the other end. Correct. That's the way the used car business works. Right. Well, it's and not. So you've got to be like on the, the numbers that Jim's talking about, but that's the basic principle. You buy a car at, in one price range, work on it to make it worth something in as another price range, and uh, then sell it and back it. 
Uh, that's something an individual can't do, and it makes a difference in the price. Uh, Jim uh, sold as an individual, which means he was doing things a little differently from that, but it's the same basic idea. But you also have to love that where you want to change your car all the time, right? That you can't fall in love with any of them when you're, when you're wanting to trade them around, right? Or you do this with cars that you're buying and selling, and you drive one and keep it. In other words, you don't necessarily have to do this on your uh, committed, dedicated daily driver. You can yeah. doing, it's, it can be just a side business. Well, and as Jim said, I guess you price it higher than you're willing to take for it, but then if somebody shows up with the money... Yeah, you take it. <laughs> you, you don't turn it. it down. <laughs> yeah. So, so would you just post an ad all the time when you were doing that, Jim? What was that? No, I, I didn't run an ad until I was ready to sell it. Because they usually sold on the first weekend. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. I'd run the three-day ad in the newspaper, you know, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But you had and a figure in mind that if somebody walked up to you and said, what would you take for it, you knew. Oh, absolutely. Because I knew what my note was. As long right. as I could pay my note off, as long as I could <laughs> pay my note off, I drove an almost new car for six months for absolutely nothing. Yeah. Right. So you weren't looking to make a bunch of money. You were just looking to drive for free. Yeah, I'm just driving cars for free. Right. And in a real estate business, you know, it's nice to have, you know, a new Cadillac, well, almost new, you know, Cadillac, Lincoln, you know, Mark VI, Town Car, Sedandeville, Fleetwoods. Well, why don't we start doing some, some Cadillac restoration investment since we've got our friend Tim Carroll up the street. And, and what I'm thinking of is we put you know, twenty or thirty thousand dollars together and and we and we have him find a car, restore it and sell it, and then split the profits. I would have to be present uh, for that deal. I'm I'm too far away. You guys <laughs> you might, no. <clears throat> I love it when I ask you guys questions that you both just kind of sit there and look at me for a minute. Well, I, I, it intrigues <laughs> me, but I can't I can't do it without uh, being able to drive over and, and uh, talk to the people and see it from time to time. I'd want to. Oh see yeah, it. Tim. It's Tim's the real too. thing that way, and he has the great love for the cars, and he's doing so much work nah, on his own. Clear. Yeah. That basically it's and and that's what you'd have to be able to do to make money restoring cars, right? Is you have to have all these skills that he's got. Mm-hmm. But uh, what it would do is it would shift some of the risk where he doesn't have to carry all the risk, mm -hmm. you know, to pick up a car and restore it and then be able to market it and find, find a spot for it. Yeah, but for an individual, uh, you know, $10,000 is a lot of money, and I wouldn't do it with somebody I hadn't talked to. Sure. You know, I'd, I'd want to meet him and talk to him, and it's, that's really sure. not in the works. Uh, I mean, I hope to get on the road that as a business year. plan. I uh, like not, it. I like it. Not, not for, you know, but just for... You know, the fun part about that would just be being involved in the project and developing it and keeping up with it and helping find parts or helping, you mm -hmm. know, find the right body to start from. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, uh, you know, talking through about the styling and, the, and putting it back on the road and then, and then uh, looking for buyers. I'm starting to get excited about that guy's doing it with an, uh, uh, an Eldorado. <laughs> what, what is that, a 2002 he's got? Yes. He discovered the extra heavy stabilizer bars. I didn't think anybody even knew about them. He stumbled across them, didn't know what they were. And I remember, did you see that in the last couple of days? Yes. Jim? Yeah, yeah, but he knew to get them. He knew to get them, yeah, because he could see a millimeter or two when he saw it in his eyes, and then most people can't. So he spotted them and got it. And I told Oh, him, I wanted that caliper that he had. He had a digital oh, caliper. Yeah, I've got one uh, laying that? around that I bought for just that purpose. So, well, stabilizer bars, I have. Uh, I have to find my tools. I don't know where. Oh, there it is. I'm not going to get out of the TV and go get it. We're about done today. Yeah. So, yeah, it's. Well, oh, you, the, you found it. Oh, good. I got it on Amazon. About thirty dollars or cheap. I think. Did I send you one? No, that nope, was. No, nope, no. Nope. That was another Hattie Info guy. Sent no, me. but that could be another tool that I have laying around here that I never use. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem with tools with me is I'll get something because I need it just for this job and then I'll. I'll put it somewhere where I can't remember where it is the next time I need it. Well, if it's that over $100, I'll rent it. Put it up. You yeah. put it up where it don't get lost. There you go. That's what I do is I put it in a special place where I can't, where it can't get lost, but I can't remember where the special place <laughs> is. That's the problem. Start making a list on your phone. Hmm. Sister, such a tool is here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I disbelieve because the... 
the uh, uh, now and then my the, the text list on my iPhone disappear, so I I have stopped trusting it. Sometimes it'll point at the cloud, and sometimes it points at the phone, and sometimes it points at never never land. And I don't I, trust I, the cloud trust for that it. reason. Yeah. 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 A slip of the credit card and everything on the cloud goes poof. Too. You know, it's uh, not not very secure. It also takes forever to move any amount of data back and forth. So, but I think that would be fun, and, and I can tell you, if you were shopping right now for a, a 1930s convertible or 1940s convertible, they're running up 50 or 60,000. And so, if you started with, you know, a, a, a husk for under 10,000, you spent 20,000 restoring it, you've still got 20 or 30 thousand dollars of margin. Yeah. Now the but, tricky thing, of course, is if you spend a hundred thousand dollars restoring it, you've lost forty thousand dollars. Right, right. And it's and it's that part where, you know, the fact that Tim's doing this all for the joy of it, mm -hmm. you know, people are paying him, but they're not paying him. You know, he's not charging them what the big shops charge for restoration. Well, he's got a labor of love, and he the cars go away, and he he's just, he's not in a position of driving a car where he's in love with every nut and bolt in it. This this can be a problem if you get too involved with the car. And and he loves them. Yeah. You know, because you can hear that in his videos. Oh, but yeah. he loves to watch them drive away too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's happy yeah, to see them out in the world. Loves to see them out, out. Loves to see those cars go make other people happy. Yeah. So I'm back looking at, uh, and I can't afford it, but but I love the look of the 49 and the 50 and the, and right in that range, where they had the you know the big rounded front end and the the uh, 331 engines and and that, and they like, of course they I were like heavy the and they weren't nearly as powerful as the lighter cars. I like the fastback 46 to 48 coupes. Yeah, that's I don't the care much for them. It has a little. Yeah. They're, don't care they're, much for that. They're they're neat looking, but yeah. I don't think I'd really want one. No, they're better to look at than to drive. I'm more along the lines of uh, what Bruce is saying, mid-50s. Yeah, a convertible. I want an early 50s convertible. I think that would pink. be the, cat, the cat's meow. It doesn't have to, does not pink have to be pink. When you, you're getting too close to a convertible. There's nothing. You, you're forcing me to say pink Eldorado convertible. There's no. nothing else. I don't actually want a pink car, I don't think. That, that we'll get a black interior. White interior, white top, white wall tires. No, don't want a white car. Black car. No, and, I said white they, top. But yeah, I've never driven convertible. one of those, so I actually need to find one that I can drive to, you know, to spend some time around to see what I what it's actually like to have it on the road, because that may cure me of wanting one. Well, are you going to want to work on it and drive it and look at it, or are you going to want to drive it? There's really two, uh, there, inside the outside. There's two different things. Well, you know, what I want for a weekend car is something that you need to tinker with because I always want to have a project. How about <laughs> an AC Cobra? the fun Cobra? thing about a weekend car is is to tinker with. Yeah, I don't I want to... Never, never saw an AC Cobra didn't have the owner leaning over working under the hood. But I don't want a replica and I can't afford a real one. Well, that's the problem with an AC Cobra is it's sort of both. But I'm not talking about the Shelby Cobra. I'm talking about the AC Cobra. Oh, I see. That had that squirrely little blatty four-cylinder engine in it, a two-liter. But the, uh, but yeah, I was looking again. Seconds. Yeah. I was looking again at the uh, like a '64 Morgan. There were a couple of those on the market for around thirty thousand. Had the TR3 or the uh, engine in it, but uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it looks like the car I already have in the driveway. How about a so, TR7? '63. I didn't like the TR7s. I, they were actually during my time, and I didn't care for them when they were new. I would have so, loved to have had one of those 3.5. The TR8 was, was the way to go, right? Because it That's had the, the one I meant. That's the yeah, one I meant. Had a little more performance, but but uh, I, I didn't really care for them at the time. Those wedge wedge shaped sports cars. Well, now the Morgan, my dad always had a had a, he and he and my mom had a Morgan in the. A uh, 53 Morgan in the 60s, I think, is what they had, and and they always, years later after after it had been ruined and sold, then they they constantly talked about that Morgan, and so it's it's that part that it has you know kind of a sentimental value, even though I never saw their Morgan because it was ruined before my time. But 
but uh, it had a, always had a sentimental value. But but that's a car that would be at an authentic car, but look like the Roadster I've got now in many ways. But you know, be original an original car from from the links at Malvern. Well, a '50s or '60s Corvette convertible would be a great weekend car. Yeah, I, I was looking at that too. The early '70s because the price is right there. That yeah. I would want. Unfor I would want one that wasn't perfectly numbers matching. Yeah, me too. Put an LS3 in it or an LS1 in it, <clears> and then, uh, you know a modern V8 in it instead of a uh, 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 427 or a 454. Well, the 454s it's... look like they were fun engines, but yeah, yeah, you, you they know, didn't do much with them back then. But yeah. uh, if they got the suspension for an engine of that weight, well then you can put a modern big block crate engine in it, and if it's over 25 years old. You don't have to get a smock sticker for it. So you can get a 502, right. drop it in, put a, 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 a turbo hydro with a, a lockup clutch in it, a later model turbo hydro four gear, and uh, uh, you got a good street car. There are a lot of but, people do that. But if I was, but if I was going to get a car that got no miles per gallon anyway, then why I'm a Cadillac no guy. Miles, why would they, they get no miles per gallon? A 454 in a Corvette is not going to be great for gas, right? No, it would not necessarily. It depends on the rear end ratio and how you drive it and the transmission. My '69 but, Chevrolet got 22 on the road, and it was a, it was a, a way close to 6,000 pounds, and it had a but turbo. But I'm a Cadillac guy, and so if I was picking a project car like that, I think I'd rather just you know get an Eldorado or get a, you know a, a '70s or a '60s or a '50s Eldorado, and that way while I'm tinkering on it and writing every day about it, then it makes sense to put those articles on Caddy Info. Well, that's a good point. Now you will not get good gas mileage with a '70s Eldorado. No. Well, you get steady, right? Nine in the city and ten on the highway. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> well, I have to disagree. The 78 Eldorado I had for about five years, it actually got pretty good mileage. Yeah, there were a few bad years. 71 to 74 were bad years. But outside of that range, though, um, the Cadillacs always got good mileage. They had a real good name for it in the 50s. And I, The other thing that has turned me off about those cars is that I don't, I, for a car I'm going to tinker with, I'd rather it wasn't front wheel drive. I like the rear wheel drive and and uh, launch it, you know, the engine in the right way and so on. No, not unless you're prepared to drop the cradle every weekend. Yeah, and so the uh, I think that would be attractive to me about the '50s cars, is the uh, you know the engines in the right way and it's their rear wheel drive and and uh, so on. But they don't have near the performance of a modern car. You know, they're just uh, cruisers. There's a one in a million that does. <laughs> extremely rare. Yeah. Well, in the same way, if you do a resto mod, if you get one with the where the engine's bad and put a a, a crate LS2 in it or LS3 in it, then it would it would do very well, right? Yeah, but and it then wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a historic car then, though. Well, then there's some real 426 Super Bs out there. There must be at least two or three of them left. None of them are Cadillacs, oddly enough. Oh, that's true. That's true. Now, I, I, the other the other one that gives me a, a, on modern cars, the one that always tickles me is the XLR. The the early XLRs, the O4s and the O5s, I see them for under twenty thousand dollars now. Mm -hmm. You know, with with fifty, sixty thousand miles on them, and for a for a car that's only going to drive three to five thousand miles a year, that's... that seems like you could you could run that another ten years and be happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I see that uh, I posted a red XLR uh, 2004 that they wanted 17 for with 60,000 yeah, dollars, mm -hmm. and boy, that's tempting as another car. And oh, and yeah. the tempting thing would be to go over and see if he'd take 12 for it, you know, oh, take yeah. 12 in cash, and yeah. then you probably could do as you say and sell mm -hmm. it for 15 another day. Well, an LS3 is small legal. You could put an LS3 in it. I'm just. Well, Jerking because that was a 2005, you have to be careful about it's. It's not gonna. It's not gonna be. You're not gonna have as much freedom as I have with the car in the garage, where I can, you know, put whatever engine in there and be happy. No, the LS3. The LS3 comes with a small certificate. You can put it in a new car. Oh you know? yeah, the new crate in, the crate yeah. engine version. Yeah. 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 Yep. 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 That by itself is around eleven thousand, though, right? Uh, something like that. Oh, crate engine. Uh, get an engine. Oh, that one. How are you gonna get 450 horsepower? Uh, shipped to your door on a forklift uh, for eleven thousand dollars with a with a one year 
Well, what's the, they actually come with a damn warranty on those things. No, I agree with you, and it's a beautiful engine if you're going to spin that. It's just that the spending $11,000 on an engine gives me pause, you know, especially if uh, I'm trying to economize on a car. So okay. that's all. I got I got no video except the uh, icons at the bottom of the screen. The screen itself is black. Yeah, I don't I've, got, I've got video back now. Mine went out for a few seconds. Yeah. But it's yeah, mine, mine, we lost the video for a moment. Now mine's back up. Uh, but we are on time, so let me let me hit the stop broadcast. Hold on just a guy, just a minute, guys. Uh, okay. Thank you for joining us this week. This is the CaddyInfo.com uh, forum chat. We do these on Thursday nights at around 7:30 Central Time, uh, 8:30 Eastern Time, 5:30 Pacific Time. That if you want to get uh, participate live, contact me on Google Plus or or contact me on the forum and let me know, and we'll try and help you get set up and and help you do some practice chats and so on if that makes you feel more comfortable. Any last words for tonight, Cadillac Jim? Uh, no, um, I lost the um, uh, the Hangout Two Bar stuff, but the video's back. Uh, the the electronic gods have glitched on us again. I'm doing just fine, and uh, I. Uh, uh, Oh, Jim Sellers has just uh, joined. <laughs> Did we oh, lose? I was I was only off for a few seconds. Okay, on yeah, two about. Okay, all right. Good. Anyway, uh, I, I just got to notice. Uh, okay, I, I, I'm, anyway, I'm happy, and I wish everyone uh, a happy uh, Memorial Day, and happy Indy Racing, and uh, a good evening. And speaking of which, Texas Jim, we've got to figure out when we can get together. I never have shown you this register in person. We ought to get together and do that sometime. Texas Jim, any last any last things to share for us tonight before we hit stop broadcast? No, enjoyed it as usual, and hope other people do too. Yeah, glad to, glad to see you guys. Hold on a second.